All right, welcome to module five. I can't believe it's module five uh, of creating assignments and delivering feedback. And so in this in this uh, module, we are looking at using the assignment tool in Moodle and different ways you might be using it, thinking about it. And within that, as we've done in other modules, <clears throat> providing some deeper context, some deeper consideration about what does it even mean to do a, to create an assignment or to have students uh, complete an assignment and what are different ways uh, we can think about giving feedback or considerations around feedback. So we'll probably spend the first half to two, uh, two, two quarters, first half to uh, two thirds uh, talking about, you know, what goes into assignments, what goes into feedback, and then we'll, uh, the last quarter, we will hop into or the last third, we will hop into Moodle and take a look at, uh, we'll hop into Moodle and take a look at exactly how to create an assignment uh, with the, the Moodle tools and also take a look at what the feedback looks like. So, one of the things that is often, um, I, I've seen this at, at, at different places, and I'm sure many of us have had this experience around uh, a, an instructor assigns something and gives nothing to really support it. You know, write a paper, uh, you know, do a presentation and provides no guidelines, no clear clarity. And I think one of the first things is always important to do is really identify what are the guidelines, what are the specifications for each part of that assignment that you want students to complete. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but you know, how does that relate to what they're doing in the course? That's always a thing I want to go back to. And also how can the students show up in that particular assignment in that particular activity? Or, or bring themselves into that assignment or bring themselves into that activity. Uh, and typically, if they're doing assignments, many times one of the things we're looking for is uh, a place for them to actually deliver or provide that assignment. So a learning management system is really important and valuable within uh, the, the whole process. And, in, you know, for those that have used assignment, you know, places to submit assignments in the past, I mean, I, I am unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, of the age when, you know, uh, you would be emailing the, the assignments to the instructor, and then the instructor would have to download it, look at it, reattach it with any kind of feedback and send it back and, and all these extra steps. And what the learning management in Moodle in particular provides is one central space where they can submit their, you know, submit whatever it is, and you can look at it, provide feedback, and it's all there contained. It's not, you know, these extra steps that can be challenging and just confusing. I know uh, it's, you know, trying to sift through a bunch of emails to figure out which students submitted things and, and whatnot um, can be challenging. So, you know, it's not that different from Google Classroom, which had that capability, but we're, we'll see later on in terms of how much, uh, what are some of the added features that Moodle has to offer. Uh, but when constructing assignments, the thing that I think is always important is really to kind of to chunk it out. Um, at that bare minimum, you should look to have two or three deadlines with any assignments uh, that those would be like the first would often be identifying the selection or the focus. Uh, so if you have them writing some kind of paper, you know, an early deadline, an early thing to do is actually identify what the focus is that they're going to write on, or if they're doing a presentation, you know, what is their, what is their goal in that presentation? And that's really helpful because ultimately we're dealing both with, uh, you know, it's a structure where it helps you to make sure that they are staying on the right track or that they're going in the direction that you were anticipating them. It's also early on for the students and it's an easy win. It's a way of building motivation. It's a way of starting to build out the, the track to actually complete whatever that final project is. Uh, then I also will encourage, or I often use in my courses, opportunities for rough drafts. And that rough draft is again, an opportunity for me to give feedback, uh, but also using that as an opportunity for students to do peer feedback. Uh, and later, this, uh, later in the fall, we'll be doing a workshop, we'll, I'll be doing a, another uh, workshop around the work, another webinar or, or uh, module around the workshop tool within Moodle, but uh, really looking and thinking about how you can leverage another step to kind of help that, you know, help that process along rather than just saying, oh, you know, here's a paper, it's due at the end of the semester, or, here's an assignment, it's due at the end of the semester, really thinking about how you stage that out. Um, also with the rough draft, you know, certainly that idea around, it doesn't have to be finished, you know, I've, I've done it, and I've seen people do it of like, oh, you know, you need to be about 80% done, or maybe half done, uh, and the goal is just to kind of help them move along. 
really, if you're thinking about big projects in the course, chunking it up to three or four different steps is really helpful for, for students to help them conceptualize where or how to move a big project forward. Um, and, you know, we know that will have downstream uh, benefits for the, you know, their own project within, within CU or projects they're taking on outside of, uh, outside of CU. And then finally, rubrics. Now, there are some folks who absolutely love rubrics. There's some folks who absolutely hate rubrics. Uh, I think rubrics can be really helpful when they are seen as a guide. I think where rubrics become detrimental is when they are taken as the territory instead of the map, right? When they are seen as, you know, the instructor has to fit what the student does into the rubric, rather than thinking about how the rubric can help uh, support or identify or help the student along. So it's, you know, when it becomes, uh, you know, that, that, that proverbial hammer to which to deal with all, you know, and see all things as nails, it's not helpful. When it's seen as a guide, as a way of supporting, as a way of guiding student learning, I think it can be helpful. And the rubric tool within Moodle uh, is embedded within the assignment and therefore makes it, again, easier for students to get a little bit more targeted feedback. So as we're talking about assignments, you know, one thing I always try to stress and I think is always important to think about in crafting them or thinking about them for a course is, you know, how does it connect to your course objectives or outcomes? Uh, if, you, if you can't draw a straight line from the objective to the thing that you're asking students to do, there, there does need to be some reflection. There does need to be some pause and consider like, well, why am I having students do this? Uh, and I'll give you an example out of my own experience is like when I first started teaching, you know, I did the thing that was, I, I'm sure so many other people have done, which is, oh, I'm teaching this type of course. And when I took this type of course, we did these types of assignments. So I'm just going to make sure we have these types of assignments. They may be but often didn't align with what the course outcomes were. They were just, that's what I was like working on is this is how it was done. And so step taking that step back and thinking about, okay, what are the things that students should be able to do or demonstrate by the end of the course? And how do I make sure my assignments align with that? How do I make sure my assignments uphold that? But when doing that, the thing to remember is that really good objectives actually should be, if it's a good objective, there should be more than one way of demonstrating it. And so this is where I, will, I, I can deviate from uh, a lot of different people in that I always want to look at my objectives and think, how can I create a situation where this is the objective that students are demonstrating? And how can I think about it in more than one way that they can demonstrate it? So the students have a choice. You know, that choice can be textual, that choice can be auditory, that choice can be video, but really thinking about what are the different uh, mediums or often the different, you know, prompts or approaches that could actually demonstrate that. And for me that, you know, when, when we start to do that, when we start to look at, you know, I want them to, to demonstrate this, or I'm, I'm hoping, you know, this is where, where we should be at the end of the course or at a certain point in the course, how do I leverage that with allowing the students to bring themselves into it, to blend their own strengths with those expectations? So kind of, you know, that's the thing I think a lot about. And it's something that as you start to build assignments within Moodle, uh, there are different tools that can certainly uplift in, and allow you to do that. And so all of this leads me to uh, what what is called open pedagogy. Um, it is a practice I've used for probably seven or eight years. Uh, it's grown out of the open educational resources movement. And what it is, it's, its main focus is when we are assigning projects or assignments or whatever in a course, how do we make sure they have real value to the student, that they're not just there to be thrown away at the end of the course, right? So uh, in my own educational experience, you know, I have had courses where we, you know, write in the blue books, the, the infamous blue books, or we've done, you know, a paper that, or a book report, or, you know, the five paragraph essay, just to prove that we can do it, but they don't have any real value. At the end of the course, they're just thrown out. And open pedagogy challenges instructors to say, wait a minute, you know, how can I leverage? How can I level up? How can I make sure that whatever the student is doing, it has merit more than just 
proving to me that they can do something because there's not really, you know, that isn't a really empowering way to think about educating, to think about having students get into the kind of work that they might do in a course. And so open pedagogy, is, you know, encourages faculty to think about this and there's different ways you can approach it. Uh, the first is thinking about it as ways of extending or creating new opportunities for students. And so one example could be actually certifications. Depending on your course, uh, if you're a lab faculty member and you know students are looking in a particular area or you know wanting to do something for their project, there are lots of different types of free certifications out there. Uh, if a student is into business or marketing, you know there's a lot of certifications that are offered through Google uh, around things like search engine optimization or how to improve ads uh, or the use of ads on different uh, platforms online. There's you know. Microsoft has a whole slew of certifications around specializing in different types of software and things like that. Uh, but there's, you know, there's others out there as well that they can also uh, discover, go, you know, and actually use. So that idea of using certifications as an assignment within the course, where they find or you identify certain certifications that are relevant to what's going on in the course. The other is really centering the student's experience, which, you know, is, is very much what we do here at CU, but really thinking about how can what's being done in the course be leveraged, um, can be leveraged to can be leveraged to where students are in their work. So, you know, if you have them doing a project, is it geared towards their work environment? Um, in that, you know, for some places, for some courses that makes total sense, for other courses, it may be a little bit more of a, of a stretch, but thinking about it and really trying to figure out if there's opportunities for it. And then there's also creating content or having students create things that can be used or repurposed elsewhere. So things like letter to the editor, op-eds, book reviews for publications, uh, a, a blog or, or article for some platform or another, or interviews. You know, I think interviews are really cool things students can do and demonstrate, you know, sophistication and in, in, of thought through questioning and then through reflecting on the interview. And what's really cool is, you know, because we live in the time that we do, students' reach can be really uh, expansive. And so even in my own experience, you know, there are times when just being on the internet, like feeling, oh, like, here's this expert, here's this person I want to learn from, or I want to ask questions of, and actually just being able to like locate and reach out to them and, and have that conversation. So in do, doing things like that, where, you know, the student is not only doing an interview that they may look to get published somewhere, they're also like, actually working on their skills of interviewing and also potentially building this connection with this expert or this person that, that they're interviewing. Um, so really thinking about those as student opportunities, things that they can do that they can actually repurpose and use um, elsewhere, use live or you know as they're going through the course, such as a certification that they can just put right onto their resume uh, before the course is even over. There's also course centered stuff. And so I've done this in, in lots of my courses where, you know, the assignments, the activities are students creating things that help present or future students learn. Uh, so for instance, materials that students can help uh, that can help other students. Uh, in one of my courses, it's a asynchronous online course. It's 15 weeks. And the last three weeks we do case studies. And the students themselves, as one of their assignments, can choose to actually develop the case study. So the last three weeks of, of, core, of the course are actually students teaching other students doing deeper dives into certain topics. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity to allow them to teach one another. Um, you know, and again, we see these types of practices show up in many different ways here at College Unbound. So uh, I'm not necessarily sharing anything new, but just reiterating, like there's really great opportunities for that. Uh, using things like core course wikis where uh, collectively the, the, the class actually builds up the knowledge, the understanding, the nuance. Uh, this can also be done in labs where the, the idea of the course wiki is people connecting their projects or the ideas within the course, they're continually sharing and, and expanding a particular area or theme that uh, the lab might be exploring that particular semester. Other things, if you're providing any kind of learning materials with the course, allowing students to annotate, re reorganize, or add to them. Um, I love in, in my courses, I'll have learning guides, which are, you know, two or three page, like, overview of, of the topic of uh, for that week. 
And each semester, students are allowed to annotate and they can add new examples, they can uh, add new resources, they can look to reframe things in ways that make more sense to other students. Uh, and all of those things then get circulated into it. So students are doing things that aren't just, you know, I did it so I got points, but actually will impact other students uh, learning. And then having students actually create a, a guide to or an ongoing series of uh, materials for the course topics. And so it can be an interview series or a dialogue series between one or two students, or uh, it can be one student or several students or a student each, student each week creating like the video or the audio guide to that particular week. And then finally, it's globally focused activities. Uh, and these are, you know, these type of assignments are where you're looking and having the student engage out in the world. So a good example of this is citizen science have, you know, in our, in some of our STEM courses, having students actually go out and engage and interact uh, and participate in crowdsourcing projects where what they're doing is contributing to larger research that's going on in the world. Uh, there's also crowdsourcing projects from museums and, and archives and lots of other places, even newspapers look for crowdsourcing opportunities where students are contributing to this kind of large project. A, a good example is um, students can participate in, or anybody can participate in transcribing Supreme Court justice notes. Uh, so the Supreme Court has been around for over 230 years, and whenever they are involved or looking at a case, they are actually, you know, they're writing up their notes and things like that. All of those notes have been preserved, and they're available online, but they're available as handwritten notes. And so there's this big project in which uh, people can help, can help turn those notes into text that is then searchable. And so depending on your course, if you're, you know, uh, you could go and look at certain cases that may have relevance to what your course topics are and have students actually participate in transcribing them and be able to literally look at the thinking process and the note process of Supreme Court justices around that particular issue. And then there's things like open knowledge projects where people are collectively contributing to something. And Wikipedia is probably the, the best example. And I think one of the things I advocate or, or you know, I think about encouraging the use of, of having students create content on Wikipedia is we, you know, the research shows pretty well that uh, there's a overrepresentation of white male European interest in topics. And given our student population, given our interest in equity and justice, the idea that classes can help work to balance that, can work to uh, provide entries that are as, import as important or if not more important uh, than some of the things on there to expand what's available. Um, the final one that I'll talk about is one that I do actually in my literature course. And that is there's a website called LibriVox, L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. And it is a site run by volunteers where they find books in the public domain and people volunteer to create audio narrations of them. And so in my course, so it's a literature course, I have students actually Again, it's a choice among several different choices um, within the course or around uh, their assignments, and they can actually create an audio narration of short stories or poems that we have in our that we read or that we look at in our class. And so it's this really cool thing where students can like create this narration, uh, put it up on the site, and now make that you know make that accessible to anybody else in the world that wants to download that. It's also really cool for my own class because whenever I teach literature or whenever I teach any course, I really try to pair up or make sure if I have textual stuff, I also have audio stuff or video stuff. I always like to try to you know expand the the different mediums. So if a student is is adding a short an audio short story, that means that's one more short story that I can point students to uh, that if they want to both read and or listen and they have that opportunity. Um, share that link. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody's asking to share that link and happy to. Let me just put it into the chat here. There we go. Um, so those are, th these are all ideas about how you expand and how you think about creating assignments that are more than just, you know, our traditional assignments. We're CU, we don't do tradition very well. Um, and so anytime I can, you know, 
I can participate and encourage and have us thinking more about those more mindful or uh, really student oriented activities that, that go beyond just your tr traditional assignments, I'm all for it. And then the other piece I just want to highlight here, in, and again, this is nothing new, this is nothing surprising. I know many of us here are always thinking about this, but this is how we provide feedback. Um, and particularly as we start to have um, assignments in Moodle, knowing that, you know, it is easy. Uh, it is easy for feedback to be uh, experienced very differently by the person giving feedback and the person receiving feedback. So a couple of things about feedback. I think the first is, is you know, making sure it's timely. Um, and I use timely in two different ways here. First, timely being the longer, it, you know, the longer a submitted assignment goes without getting feedback, the less and less the student cares about the actual feedback and cares more and more about the grade. Um, and we, you know, we, we want students caring about the feedback. And, you know, if we could be a gradeless institution, I'm pretty sure almost everybody would be on, most people would be on board with that. Um, so really trying to make sure as you're starting to identify when assignments should be due in the course to also identify, you know, when is a reasonable time for you to get to grade those? Because if you're saying, oh, this is going to be due on Sunday and I'm not going to actually be able to touch it until the following Sunday, you know, there is a there, there, there continues to be this large gap. And the other reason that's a, a, a concern is if you have consecutive assignments and so therefore a student is submitting something and isn't getting feedback before that next assignment is due or before the, like the day or two before they're starting or like before a day or two before the assignment is due. Um, we're also creating stress and challenges for students in that they can't get feedback to get a sense of what your feedback is like and what things they need to know or just even your style so they can be prepared for that next time. So timeliness is, you know, is one of those areas to really think about even when you're structuring your course and thinking about the assignments. Clarity is another, um, and I say this because, you know, there's ways we often think we're clear, but there's times which, you know, even in my, own, you know, in my own experience, I realized, man, I really need to work on my clarity. A good example is if you're giving feedback and you're doing things like annotations, I often, you know, I'll often ask questions, and I, in the past, I have seen these as questions just like, oh, these are thoughts in my head I want to share with you or rhetorical questions or, or what have you. And I had a student at one point say like, what am I supposed to do with those questions? And so really thinking about when you give feedback, articulating what what they, you know, what does, what does it mean for me to ask a question in a space? Is that something I need an answer for? Is that something they're losing points on? Um, it usually, it, by and large, it isn't but how do they know that? And so really thinking about that clarity of what it means to give feedback and when you are giving feedback, what to what end, you know, is it clear? Just, you know, I'm just, I'm curious. I'm not looking for a response, just, you know, giving you some food for thought, you know, and then ask the question, something like that. Actionable. I think this is, this is often um, where some feedback can fall apart, where it's either there's no clear set of like, okay, here's the like, condense clear how to move forward versus like here's the laundry list of all the things that need correcting. Um, we want to be more in that first bucket. We want to like give some clear direction on here's how to move forward. That could be here's how to move forward in this assignment because you might be doing revisions or it's a rough draft um, or it's here's how to move forward for or how best to prepare for the next uh, activity or assignment within the course but really making sure whatever you provide them that it is it's clear and it's actionable that there's things that you are guiding them towards that they can look at and be like okay this is what i need to be on the lookout for my next assignment it doesn't mean you have to walk them through each and every step but giving them those those guardrails Tone is so challenging. Um, even when we don't, even when we think we are, we're communicating as, as positively or as, as, as in a way that's trying to uplift the student, um, we, we may not be. And this is one of the, this for me in, in my own experience is one of those really interesting experiences of intention and impact and having to really think about that as it happens with tone.
One of the cool things about Moodle and the assignment feature is that you can actually do short recordings of uh, one to two minutes, either audio or video recording, and give feedback to students that is audio or video. And I think that is huge because the challenge we run into is no matter what we write, the student is going to read that differently. They're like, some students are going to read that through the lens of all their, you know, of their insecurities. Some students are going to read that through the lens of like that one instructor who was just horrible, or you know, often more than one instructor. And that's always going to stick with them when they're getting feedback. So really thinking about tone and how you communicate it in text and being very mindful about that. And also recognizing, you know, we do have opportunities to give feedback with video and audio, and that can make a huge difference in how it's received, right? That, that catching that additional context of emphasis and rhythm and, you know, emotion in the voice can make a huge difference. And then finally revisions. Um, this is something I think, you know, Again, at, at CU, I see this happening a lot, so I, I'm always excited about it, but really thinking about, you know, um, is there any good reason not to allow for revisions? Uh, I, like, my philosophy, to make clear, not necessarily CU's, but my personal philosophy is, like, uh, revisions are always on the table for all assignments in a course. Um, that's radical for some, and I wouldn't be saying, like, you know, that's what everybody should be doing. But I do think, you know, within the course, really looking and thinking about where is there room for students to be able to revise? Because, again, this is a learning space and we are trying to make this a, a space for them to grow. And, you know, inevitably, what students submit is going to often be their first draft. And so why not give space for them to, to grow from that uh, beyond just getting the feedback, but being able to actually act on the feedback. So some food for thought around that doesn't mean you have to do it, but something to be thinking about. Um, so at this point, I'm going to actually transition over to going into Moodle and showing you how to create an assignment. Before I do, uh, anybody, want, anybody have questions, comments, et cetera, this is my I have to take a break because I've been talking and I need some water. And also I wanna hear from folks. <laughs> All right, then I'm gonna hop into showing how to create an assignment. Uh, so as always, you go into your course, you make sure that edit mode is on in the upper right hand corner. In this case, I'm going into my sandbox. You figure out where you wanna add it in the course. You select add an activity or resource and assignment is usually the first one in the left hand corner. Once you're here, you want to give it a name. I'm going to call it another rad assignment because my goal is to bring the word rad back into use. So once you add that description, uh, you're going to come into the first, a counterintuitive element of Moodle. So when you create an assignment, you want to provide some guidance. You want to provide some input on what the students should be doing. What I'm going to tell you, and this is where it's counterintuitive, is write in like write write your instructions in here and do not write your instructions and i'm not going to spell that right but that's fine in here and that's going to seem counterintuitive because this is asking you for activity instructions we're going to put a pin in this and come back to it in a few minutes but just know that what we've written in these two areas so that when we get back to it it will make sense Additional files, if you have any handout, have anything that students may be needing uh, to complete the assignment, you can just drag and drop it in here, or you can click on the little arrow and browse your computer and attachment, attach it. So you might have them working on a template. You might have a document that you want them to read and review before they do the assignment. You can just attach it right there, nice and easy. Availability. Um, allow submissions. This I'm going to turn this off, but uh, if you select this, then you can choose a date at which students can start submitting. Uh, the due date is when the assignments are due. Strong emphasis here, always make sure your assignments have due dates, uh, or ideally that your assignments should have due dates. There can be exceptions why it may not, but one of the values here is if you select this, this means on the students, on the students' end, under their calendar in Moodle, 
across all their courses, they will see when the different things are due. So it's a really valuable way for the student to be able to kind of visualize and get a sense of in each week what's going on. So due dates are really important and valuable in that, that regard. Cutoff date is simply that. The due date is when it's due. Cutoff date is when a student can no longer submit it. Uh, my view on this is I'm never going to not allow a student to submit something, even if it's after the due date, but different folks work, you know, see it in different ways. Uh, remind me to grade by is a nice feature where, you know, I if the assignment's due on Sunday, I can set the remind me to grade by, you know, for Tuesday or Wednesday. So I'll get an email notification being like, hey, don't forget to go grade these. Then I can, you know, I need, I know I need that, that extra little ping to, to make sure I stay honest. Um, so it's a nice feature for me to have. I like seeing that it's in Moodle. Submission type. This gets into a really interesting area where you can have students submit files, right? So file submissions, they're uploading a document, they're uploading an audio file, et cetera, or they can just submit online text. So you can do one, both, or uh, you can do either or. You can do both or one or the other. And what I strongly recommend for this is if you have a, like, if you have a preferred way, then make sure that you use that preferred way. So if you really want files, then make sure you don't have online text provided because it can cause confusion in the students. They may look at that and be like, am I supposed to copy and paste? Um, so just making sure you use whichever one you want. We're going to ignore these two items because they're not that relevant. These are the standards. Students, I've yet to see students upload more than 20 files in a given assignment, and uh, one gigabyte is more than enough space to, to be uploading things. Accepted file types. This feature is really nice if I want students to submit a particular file type. So I want them to submit a Word document. Uh, if I select that choose option, I can come down here and say, I want them to select uh, word processor programs or document files. And then it gives me the list of document files that, um, that, the, that Moodle will accept when the student is submitting. I can go further and start to check individual ones. I like to keep it at this level of just like the file type level and not get into the nuance. But it has them for lots of different things, for image files, for presentations. So if you have them doing a presentation, you can make sure they can only upload things that are presentations. They can't unnecessarily upload a, if I have this unchecked, it really does have to be a, you know, a, a Google slide or a PowerPoint or, uh, or the like. So I can select that and save. Feedback types, you're going to largely leave this alone. This is exactly how it needs to be. And we'll see what these look like when we actually look at assignments and feedback uh, after we, we create this. Submission sessions, ugh, if I can talk, submission settings. Uh, the only th really, again, these are things you can largely leave as is. Um, Let's see, if you don't check a type, yeah, it, so there's a question in the chat. If you don't check a file type, uh, will it accept, will all file types be accepted? Yes. So if you don't choose anything, then it will allow for students to upload any file type. Submission settings, if for some reason you want to limit the amount of submissions, um, you certainly can choose that here and play around with how many times you want them to be able to. Uh, again, I'm of the I'd rather them over submit than under submit. Um, and I haven't been in a situation where I find students are uh, really abusing that to any degree that I would want to change it. So I like to leave things as default as often as possible. Group settings, we won't get into. If you're doing groups, there's ways that you can play around with uh, who submits or how people submit. Notifications, uh, the one feature I like here to just bring your attention to is notify graders, this one right here, notify graders about late submissions. So what's nice about this is papers are due on Sunday. I went in on Tuesday. I provide feedback for everybody. Like I'm all caught up. But then on Wednesday, you know, Jose submits a paper. Now, if I have this set as yes, then I'm going to get an email notification being like, hey, Jose submitted the paper. 
I want that because otherwise I would continually have to be looking in here to be like, oh, did anybody submit anything late? Um, so this is a way to be for me to be pinged without having to worry about uh, whether I've missed something or not. Get into grades. Uh, typically, again, here you would put in your point value. Uh, there's three different grading methods. Simple direct grading is where, you know, if it's a score of 100, you would put in anything from 0 to 100. And then you would also have a space to provide textual or video audio feedback. We're going to look at the difference between a marking guide and a rubric uh, once we save this and display this. Uh, but just know that these are. These are also also useful tools for providing feedback for students uh, and giving them some guidance about what uh, an assignment entails. So the rest of this stuff we really don't have to pay attention to. It's not that relevant to us at this juncture. Common module settings. Uh, again, here you can choose if you want this to be shown in the course or if you want to hide it. So maybe you're not done with it yet, but you want to save it, then you might hide it from students and then go in and finish it later. Um, but if you are ready to show it, then you can always just, it, the default is show on course page. Restrict access, you can play around with settings so that if you want students to do something before they can actually submit this, you know, maybe it's they read a, uh, they, they look at a page or they participate in a discussion or they complete a different assignment before they do this assignment. You know, if you have students doing stacked assignments or, or you're doing that big project where you've broken it up into pieces, you may want to make sure they submit part two before they can submit part three. And then activity completion. Uh, the, def it's, the default is to allow students to automatically, uh, for students to manually mark it as complete. I like to use the automatic completion. So I choose the show activity complete when conditions are met. And then in here, what I do is I choose students must view this activity and they must submit the activity to complete it. What I like about this option is it makes it very clear for the students if they're already done, right? So if you've been in Moodle at all, you'll notice when you look at, if you go and you look at a page or something like that, over on the left, it'll have a circle and then all of a sudden it will be green because you've actually completed it. That's the activity completion at work. And so for students, it's, it's easy or it's helpful to them to be like, oh, I know I already completed this. I don't have to go in and look at it. It's got the little green dot next to it. It's done. Um, so this is why I emphasize using this, this particular option. Tags, again, I would say ignore. There's not really much to use there um, or that's relevant for uh, the kinds of things that we do here at CU. And this is just something to understand about Moodle is that uh, there's lots of these different choices because Moodle is uh, used in many different contexts. And so some things make sense to use and other things you just don't have to worry about. And one of the things I'll be sharing with is a bit of a guide to kind of like, okay, if I'm looking at an assignment, what do I have to care about and what don't I have to care about? So I'm going to hit save and display. And now it brings us into the assignment. So notice that by saving and displaying, I already met one of the criteria. I've already viewed it, uh, but I still need to, as it shows right here, make a submission. It shows me the due date nice and clear right here at the top. And then it shows me some grading summary information. So it tells me if it's hidden from students or not. It tells me how many students are in this course, who's submitted, how many needs grading, and how much time remaining. So say I come in here as a student, and actually I'm going to switch over to the student role just to show this. So I come in here, I've read the instructions, and notice there's a little bit of different information here as a student. It tells me the attempt number, it tells me the status, grading status, how much time before it's due, and also I can provide comments to the instructor as a, as a means of having a little bit of dialogue. But I come in here, I'm ready to submit, now I'm going to hit add submission. All right, so I need to upload a file. Here is where I want to go back to that discussion about where you put in your instructions. So notice we have here, write your instructions here and do not write your instructions here. What's happened or the way Moodle does this is it puts the activity instructions page on the submission page. And if you are a student and you come, you know, and you've clicked on 
you know, this assignment, you're not necessarily going to click add submission until you're ready to submit, right? Like most of us aren't going to be like, oh, I'm not going to submit. I don't have anything to submit yet, which means if you don't, you're not going to click on add submission and then you're not going to see that area of activity instructions. So this is, this is that big difference that I, I was trying to make earlier or just draw attention to is it really is important to put the instructions in the description area. Otherwise, students are likely to get confused. They're not likely to see the instructions until they go to add submission. But add submission, as a la its language suggests you're ready to submit. So they somehow have to know the instructions are in there and go into it anyway. So I just I, I draw out that point a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, overemphasizing that because I want to make sure faculty see that and understand that that difference there. All right. So we've created our assignment. It's great. It's ready to go. What I want to do now is just flip over and show you what it looks like to actually grade assignments or to once assignments start to come in. So I'm going to come over to this other assignment that I created. And in this case, we've had people that have submitted, right? Two people have submitted and one needs grading. So when I'm at this point, I can view all submissions or I can just go right into grading and it's gonna bring me into the first paper to grade. But let's look at view all submissions. What's nice here is it gives me the layout. It gives me a sense of, you know, all the students in the course and what their status is. So I can tell by the green here that this is, these have been submitted, this one's been submitted for graded, for grading and has been graded. This one is still waiting to be graded. I can, you know, look at their scores. I can look at the files that have been submitted, when they've been submitted. And then over on the right here is actually feedback that I've given this first assignment, but not the second assignment. So pretty straightforward, great. Now I wanna go and grade this student. I select grade. And this is where for, in terms of giving feedback, it gets really cool and interesting within Moodle. So Moodle has this program that allows documents to be converted to PDFs and then allows you to annotate them, right? So say I come in, I'm looking at the student's work and I wanna make a comment. I can come up here and click the little uh, sticky note and I can just kind of, you know, drag and drop and write in my comment. You know, I really liked how you frame this. And so, boom, it now becomes a comment that is on this document that the student will be able to see. I can do other things. I can highlight. Now, it defaults to red in highlight, which I don't get me started on red pens and red ink and the trauma of my own educational experience. So I'm going to change this to something maybe a little bit more exciting to, you know, uh, let's, let's go with green, right? See you green. So maybe I want to just hi highlight something, bring attention to something. It also has stamps and I am not above using things like smiley faces to indicate I really like the paragraph. Um, you have a free writing or a pen tool that you can click and use that to, you know, circle or, or bring emphasis to or an, you know, a line tool where you can just, you know, bring some attention to something. So you can annotate this and provide inline comments and feedback to, uh, to students on the, the, work, the work itself. So that's a really cool thing you can do with as you're reading through and looking at the paper. Over on the right, now we get into discussing the difference between a grading rubric and a marking guide. So what we see here is a rubric. And we know it's a rubric because we have both the, uh, we have the different criteria and we have the different levels of evaluation. So in this case, the levels are did not complete, partially completed, completed. And so what's cool is, you know, you can develop this as, a, as, more, as, as more sophisticated or less sophisticated, more details, clarity, et cetera. Um, this is just something I very easily whipped together for, um, uh, for the teaching and learning with Moodle course. So I can go through and I can decide, oh, you know, partially completed, completed, right? I can just very easily click these things. The computer itself will add the numbers up for the final grade. And then down here, I can actually provide additional feedback, right? So I can write some stuff or 
this is where I can do that audio or video feedback. So I can select the audio tool and just start recording and share like, oh my gosh, you know, I was really excited about what you did here. Like go through whatever it is. I can communicate that voice, that, that energy. And the nice thing I like about the record audio and video feature is it, it limits it to two minutes. And I think that's valuable for us as educators to, you know, think about that, that idea of being concise, being clear. And, you know, especially if it's a video, not trying to take up too much time or, or bandwidth for that matter. So when I'm done, I hit stop recording. I attach the recording, it pops it right in there. So I can give feedback, everything's looking great. When I'm done, I can hit save and show next. And that will bring me to the next student's uh, paper, or I can just hit save changes and exit. Uh, in either case, notify student is, uh, the default is to have it checked, which means once I hit save changes and there's a grade, the student is going to get an email saying, hey, this item has been graded. So again, it's a nice mechanism. It's a nice way of pinging the student saying, hey, something has been graded. Feel free to go check it out in Moodle. Um, so that is the grading piece here. This is the grading, uh, the grading rubric. I also want to show the marking guide. So this is a different assignment. But similar setup here where, you know, we have the, the uh, it's almost, it is the exact same document, but now we have the marking guide. And so with the marking guide, you still have those criteria, right? So I have criteria set up and each criteria has a maximum point value. In this case, it's 20. And I can choose anywhere between zero and 20 points for this for this particular criteria. So this is where it's different from the, if we look at the rubric, the rubric, I pre-select the exact amount of points for each of the levels. In the marking guide, I just set a chunk and then, you know, put in what I think is the appropriate amount of points. But I also have this text box to, text box to really dig into and provide clarity about why the student received that score. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's, they're obviously very similar. There's obviously some really useful ways you might use them, uh, both of them, even within a given course, depending on what the, you know, the assignment or the activity is. But just know that, that that's the difference is the, the points are more flexible within a marking guide. They're more static in a rubric, but you can also do different levels of um, different layers of, uh, sorry, different levels of evaluation. Um, is there a way to grade an assignment as complete, incomplete, and revisions needed in Moodle? Yes. When you are creating, let me take a step back and say, yes, there is. It requires a few extra steps of creating that scale, because what you're using right there is really a scale. It's not really numerical grades, which is, you know, that is definitely things we are looking for. And so this is actually something we will talk about in the uh, grading, uh, the, the module on grading next week, uh, that sh you can create that scale and therefore have that as one of the, have that as a choice. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so that is assignments and feedback. And uh, we've got a couple minutes left. So I am happy to, even if we didn't have minutes left, I'm happy to entertain questions, comments, uh, anything that people want to uh, see again or discuss.